one more thing beforehand. Oh, hey. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Let me see here. 36 days. <laughs> 36 days to C4N. I am so sorry. Let me, you know, his, I don't know how many of you know about C4N. I'm, I'm bringing up one real thing real quick here because I think it's important. All right, here we go. All right. So C4N started um, four years ago, but we didn't meet last year. It used to be called the Conference for Neighborhoods, uh, but nobody likes to go to a conference anymore, so we just call it C4N, um, and, and we now have this fancy thing that says it's a one-day training and networking opportunity for anybody who wants to make a positive difference in their neighborhood. Um, and this year, uh, in addition to having uh, Mayor Cooper speaking and having uh, Chief Drake speak, uh, we have uh, a 25 workshops, facilitated conversations, presentations, and panel discussions, and they're all based on eight key neighborhood passions. One of those passions is uh, is um, neighborhood beautification in the environment uh, presented by Republic Services. Um, and uh, I wanted to tell you that uh, there are three great workshops that we're doing. Uh, Patrick King's leading one called Environmental Justice in Our Neighborhoods. Uh, then we have a panel discussion that's really bringing together a, a great team of people to talk about what a healthy neighborhood really looks like. Um, and then we have another fantastic panel uh, that's going to be talking about how to create green spaces and places to play. Um, and that's just three of the uh, 24 um, breakout sessions that we're going to have. Um, and so registration deadline is May 10th. Uh, I'm going to put the link in the room so that you can uh, see it um, and check out uh, C4N Nashville. Um, and I'm also, for those of you who were kind enough to give us your mailing address, your full mailing address, uh, I'm going to mail you one of our packets so that you can see it in full color. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Well, hello, hello, hello. Welcome, everyone, to the Neighborhood Passions Affinity Network, presented by Google and Neighbor to Neighbor. I'm Valerie Otinellis, and I'm going to be your host this evening. Um, tonight, uh, we're going to focus on one of the eight neighborhood passions, uh, neighborhood beautification and the environment, presented by Republic Services. <laughs> um, the topic tonight uh, is the wonders of fireflies and how to keep them glowing. I love that. Uh, and uh, so the, the weather is warmer, spring has sprung, uh, and so for one local resident and botanist, this has her looking forward to the fireflies and seeking to teach others about best practices for fostering their flashes in your own, in your backyard. We're excited to have Sunny Fleming to and talk to us about that. Uh, Sunny is a lifelong Tennessean whose passion for the outdoors led her to receiving um, a degree from UT Chattanooga in plant ecology and botany. Her work has taken her all over the Southeast US and even to Madagascar. She now works for the global leader in uh, geographic information systems. She'll have to explain that to us a little bit. Um, Pronounce Esri, did I say it right? You sure did. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Uh, she continues to involve herself in the conservation community. Uh, she has a particular fondness for initiatives that allow folks to take tangible action in small ways uh, for a broader impact, which has brought us here tonight and thinking about fireflies. All right, Sunny. <laughs> Thank you so much, Valerie. I really appreciate it. And um... Yeah, my, my firefly initiative that I'll talk to everyone about tonight, you know, there's kind of a, it was, it was the means to an end of more kind of ulterior motives and ulterior passions that I have related to, to Tennessee and our, our biodiversity. And so I'll start out the whole discussion by really talking a little bit about biodiversity in general and, and something that I really love, which is called island biogeography, which is kind of a, a 
particular subset of geography um, discipline. So I'll try not to make it boring. I tend to be really energetic and hyper person. And <laughs> so um, as my colleague David Withers, my former colleague David Withers and, and Ruth Tucker on the call too, they can attest to that, that I can be really active and energetic. So I'll try and um, I'll try and have it make sense. And at first it's going to be like, what does this have to do with fireflies? But I think we'll get there. And so hopefully I'll weave the story for you all. And I'll start sharing my screen in just a moment. So I'll share screen two. All right, verbal confirmation that folks can see my screen. Yep, thumbs up from Valerie, perfect. All right, fantastic. So yes, the, wonder, the wonders of fireflies and how to keep them glowing. Um, I have to give credit to Jim for that title and I think it's amazing and I'm going to have to reuse it elsewhere. Um, but really, it's about small choices that we can make that then accumulatively have a big impact both on our neighborhood, our environment, our own personal enjoyment of our backyards, all sorts of, of positives that can come out of from taking some action steps here. But that quick biodiversity lesson is where I'm going to start. Oh, and Valerie, to answer your comment or your question. Um, yeah, so geographic information systems. You're going to see a lot of maps tonight. And uh, geographic information systems is all about data, but spatial data. And so when we think about spatial data, it can really be anything, you know, because everything is happening somewhere on the planet or in space or anywhere. So that's really uh, what geographic information systems is all about is how do we manage that data, but then also how do we do something with that data to better our world. So. Um, the use case that I get to talk about now, unfortunately, is that in the past year, you've probably seen a John Hopkins COVID-19 dashboard. Um, so that is GIS, and that is the software that I work with on a daily basis, and that's a lot of what you're going to see here. Um, so that's a little bit about geographic information systems, and and a lot of my interest spans and in, in kind of ties to geography in some way or another, which is why I think I'm so drawn to that particular discipline. So, all right, back to the biodiversity lesson. So we're gonna start at a global level. Are we? Let's see, My, I need to refresh my map. So, and other folks are coming up, which is good. Of course, this is getting recorded, you know, when I mess up the first part. All right, so we're starting at a global level here with our biodiversity. And what this map is, is a map of our global biodiversity hotspots. Um, and if you look, you know, here's North America, you can see California lighting up here. You can see Mexico. Of course, we always hear about the Amazon. And then you see what we call the coastal plain with the Florida panhandle and the Mississippi embayment. And then there's all these other global hotspots. We've got some China, Japan, Australia, um, all of these places. And, and global hotspots, biodiversity hotspots, are places where, um, according to the Wikipedia definition, um, a biogeographic region with significant levels of biodiversity that is threatened by human habitation. So when we are looking at a global level, it's you know got a particular threshold for criteria, but I think it's kind of unfair because there's areas that aren't necessarily popping up here that probably deserve to. And one of those areas very much so is Tennessee. And we do have some components of biodiversity hotspots in Tennessee, um, but I think they deserve a little more recognition. And that biodiversity, when we look at it globally, it's 8.7 million species of plants and animals in the world. But scientists think they've only really identified 1.2 million species, so just a fraction of species that we actually know about globally. And that is having impacts too in our own backyards because there's still species in Tennessee that we haven't described and we don't necessarily know about and they are continuing to be discovered, um, which I think, I don't know, when I learned that I was shocked. Um, and so I, I hope it's something that kind of opens your all eyes to like, wow, Tennessee is pretty cool. So diving in further though, if we're coming into North America, this is a map of imperiled species richness. So what does that mean in layman's terms? It means that um, these spots that are brighter have more species that are threatened 
than other spots. And so it looks very similar to what we were seeing on that biodiversity hotspot map where we've got Florida, we've got California kind of lighting up, but we have a lot of the Southern Appalachians and the Appalachians in general lighting up, but then also just all of Tennessee. So here's the Central Basin, here's the Appalachians. And the reason for that is because there's actually just a ton of species there in the first place. So naturally you get a higher likelihood that some of these are going to be rare and threatened. But also in the Eastern US, we have a lot more population density and development going on. So they are, there's more imperiling effects here. <laughs> so that's why we see some of this popping up. And this information is com coming from a 501c3 called NatureServe. And uh, David Withers, who is on the call, it works with our Natural Heritage Program. And Tennessee's Natural Heritage Program is one of many heritage programs that actually report up sensitive species information to NatureServe. And NatureServe works globally. And so they've actually modeled this and put this together to create maps like this that help us see where our hotspots are kind of popping out. So if we dive into Tennessee a little bit more, I think it really takes home how much we actually light up. So you can see, you know, South Carolina over here, when they start to get into the mountains, they're lighting up a little bit of their coastal plain lights up. Yeah, yeah, Georgia and Alabama, they've got some cool stuff going on too. So does Kentucky, but look at Tennessee. Tennessee is lit up pretty much across the map. And I think that speaks to the biodiversity that we have here in Tennessee. And when we looked at that global map, we did see the Amazon, we did see these other cool places and we hear about these places in you know, school and stuff like that. But I think what's sad is that we're missing the mark on the own kind of mystery and amazement that we have in our own backyards with our own biodiversity. You know, we can compare ourselves to these really amazing, awesome places when it comes to what we have here naturally. Um, but it doesn't make it into the books, and I don't know why. That's probably a whole other philosophical discussion. But um, if you grew up in Tennessee, then you probably always heard in school that we were like three states. There's the West and the Middle and the East. And even when you look at our own government structure, it's still very much broken out into regions by West, Middle, and East, which makes sense. Um, in the West, we really have these swamps in the lowlands. So there's Real Foot Lake, and there's these really cool um, really interesting habitats in West Tennessee. And then, and you can kind of see that here, you know, it's kind of shaded in purple. As we move east, we start to get into the Highland Rim here. And there's some really cool, like um, old historic grasslands and barrens that are on our Highland Rims. And then the Central Basin is super, super cool. And it is a globally rare habitat, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. But then you get into the plateau and that's really known, the plateau and the mountains, you know, we think of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, we think of those rich forests. And so they really are kind of three different habitats, which accounts for some of the reason that we have so many species here, because there's so many different places that they can live, little niches that they can occupy. Um, when we look at the, you know, biodiversity across the U.S., Tennessee alone accounts for having at least 20% of all plant species that we can find in the US. That's crazy. We have a, about 3000 vascular plant species and that's not even including mosses and lichens and liverworts and all the little tiny things that, that we tend not to count as much. And our animal diversity is similarly impressive. So you're looking at the Duck River here and it's lighting up. And that's because we have the, some of the highest biodiversity of freshwater mus mussel species. I mean, we could go on and on and, and talk about Tennessee forever and our biodiversity here. But I think it's something that a lot of people don't know about. I think we really take our state biodiversity for granted. So if we zoom into the Central Basin, I mentioned before, it's a globally rare habitat and it's not found anywhere else in the world. And this habitat is, is called the limestone barrens or limestone glades, cedar glades, yada yada. Um, some good examples are going to be at Long Hunter State Park and at Flat Rock State Natural Area, Couchville State Natural Area. You can go and see these things on some of our public lands, but the majority of it is actually covered by Nashville. So Nashville is, you know, kind of over here. We've got Columbia, Franklin down here, Murfreesboro over here. So you can imagine these are some of the fastest expanding you know, developments happening in the state of Tennessee, and a lot of it is being built on this globally rare habitat. 
Um, and we know this because we have some clues. And so some of those clues, and because I have a botany background, I'm a little biased here. Sorry, David Withers. But uh, Astragalus bibulatus, this Echinacea tennesseensis, and Dahlia foliosa, these three plant species are federally endangered plant species, or were previously. Echinacea is now off the list. And they only occur here in the central basin of Tennessee. And we have a number of species that are called endemic species that only exist in the central basin and nowhere else in the world. So we have a really special habitat here. Um, and again, I just feel like we take it for granted. Those, these aren't necessarily lessons that we learn growing up. <laughs> I went to public school. I don't know about other folks, but I didn't learn these lessons in my public school days. And I think it's really unfortunate because this is our backyard. So I promise this will relate to fireflies in a minute. But the last point I want to drive home, I took this screenshot of our database that tracks our rare species. And whenever I gave presentations for natural heritage, when I used to work at the state, I would show this to folks because I think it drives the point home that these are all of the known tracked species in Tennessee. And if you're looking at this map, it covers basically all of Tennessee. And I think it drives the point home how much species richness we have here and how much diversity we have here. It's super dense. And again, those places that are lighting up, we have the Smokies, we have our central basin, we have this Highland Rim area. I think West Tennessee with all the agriculture, I actually think there's a lot to be discovered here in some of these gaps. I just simply think they're understudied. So I just want to drive that point home. All right, but tangible conservation. All of this is really big and global and things that we hear about all the time are climate change and you know these heart-wrenching photos of polar bears on their floating little ice cap and these issues feel too big they feel too far away too exotic how can we actually do anything real to in our daily lives to change any of this and that's something that i feel like the conservation community has a pr problem with we are not necessarily putting out messaging that feels tangible to people. We're just banging them over the head with bad news constantly. Um, and I don't think that's a good way to approach conservation. And one thing, going back to my passion for island biogeography, these are kind of the fathers of island biogeography. And uh, it's more old white dudes, but these guys are kind of cool. And they had an argument in the 1970s and they weren't running for political office. So it's kind of an interesting time to be alive, I'm sure. Um, but this guy on the left is a guy named Daniel Simberloff. And this guy on the right is a guy named Jared Diamond. And in 1970, Jared Diamond published this paper where he said, all right, the best way to go about conservation is to purchase giant tracts of land. So he's thinking like Yosemite scale and things like that. But if you look around Tennessee, we don't necessarily have giant tracts of land that are up and for sale and that the state can buy to conserve. So Simberloff countered and said, no, I don't think that that's the only valid way to approach conservation, that small conservation is also valid. And so this became a really famous argument that happened in the 1970s. It has pretty much colored our conservation philosophy moving forward even today. Um, and the thing that was really the point of their argument and that a lot of our politicians could learn from is that both of these approaches were valid and both of them had a place for achieving a solution. So I think about that when it comes to Nashville. I think of all of our little backyards as our own nature preserves. And I think that's the point I wanna drive home with fireflies and part of the reason I chose fireflies. So that's kind of the point. Each, of, each one of our yards is its own nature preserve. And collectively, if we're all doing something in our own backyard to help the health of our environment, then that becomes an accumulatively big space across Nashville. So to date, the folks that I have gotten to sign the Firefly Pledge, you can see we're starting to kind of build little networks and little corridors of people who are pledging to do something good for the benefit of fireflies. And what that's doing is it's affecting other species as well for you know, a lot of different benefits. And we're starting to build those corridors. So even though I only have point 
0.02 acres or something, 0.02 acres in East Nashville, I'm still able to do some good. So why fireflies? Um, this is one of the questions that I get sometimes. And first of all, fireflies are just super cool. And I think that's kind of our visceral reaction that we all have to fireflies is, wow, these are really beautiful and they're super cool. And that's something that we kind of call charismatic megafauna. Mega, obviously, these larger species. Um, but you know, earlier I was saying we have 8.7 million species potentially in the world, probably more than that. But how many can you actually name off the top of your head? So we tend to only know a few species. Um, we know the ones that are really super cute and fuzzy and that we want to hug even if they'll maul us. Um, and then we know the ones that are really scary and that we have a different kind of visceral reaction to, but I love snakes, they're not that scary. Or if they're really beautiful and you know we have that kind of emotional reaction to them. And fireflies actually do the same thing for us and it anchors our emotion to something that we can actually do something about and affect change on. And people start to rally around it because it's real for them at that point. Whereas talking about the environment and conservation and these scientific concepts, they can be really abstract and they don't pull on our heartstrings. So that's why I really chose fireflies as our topic here to kind of rally around our environmental initiatives. So with all that good stuff, I don't know what's going on. I think my husband's walking around back here. Um, so with all that, we'll actually show you the hub that I built and what we've been sharing around um, to the neighborhoods. Let's see, I'll check the chat real quick. All right. Yes, the author, Jared Diamond. Yes, gun germs and seal, that same guy. Um, all right, not too many questions yet, good. All right, so let's pull up our hub. Um, so yeah, part of this kind of started as my own passive aggressive initiative to, to tell my neighbors to do better, <laughs> to turn their lights off, to stop spraying pesticides and things like that. And I thought, well, you know, I can be a jerk about this or maybe I can try and spin it into something useful and good. And so the Rosebake Firefly Initiative um, was kind of born out of that. And, uh, you know, we kind of start here with some information about fireflies in general. So talking to that biodiversity, I think something that people don't know is actually how many species of fireflies we even have in Tennessee. I think we just think it's the one, but it's not. Um, so globally, there's about 2000 species of fireflies and they're actually really understudied species. So we think there's more. Um, in the USA, we think there's at least 200 species and about 25 of those are in Tennessee. Um, so you may be familiar with like synchronous fireflies that are in East Tennessee in the mountains. Um, and then just my own observations in my backyard here in Nashville. Um, I'm not an entomologist, but I think I identified at least three different species of fireflies, but that needs to, to be a, an actual entomologist needs to confirm that. So it's not just the one species that we have in the backyard. Um, and so one thing that I kind of want to get people to rally around are these really tangible things that they can do to help foster fireflies in their backyard. So one problem that we have in Nashville, especially with our neighborhoods being gentrified and new developments coming in. And I think people move here too from out of state and don't, don't necessarily know anything about the fireflies. They haven't experienced them. Um, so light pollution has become a major problem in Nashville. And I, I know, I think there's some uh, even, you know, legal initiatives going on uh, and some policies around that. I wish I was better versed on it. So the first thing you can do is really go dark. And this is all about reducing or eliminating your outdoor lighting and swapping security lights out for things that are motion detection. Um, so if we actually dive into this, if we say learn more, and we can open up this tab and we can um, read a little bit more about what it means to go dark. And so this is where, you know, there's no dating app for fireflies. Why do they flash in the first place? And they flash to try and find each other and, and mate and create more. So if we have all this light pollution going on and they can't see each other, then they can't mate. And then over time, their populations begin to reduce because, you know, they're not getting it on. So that's a problem. Um, and I think there's just some really interesting information in here. There's other applications here. This YouTube video that I found is absolutely stunning. Um, so I encourage you to, to watch it. 
and then A Sky Without Stars dives a little bit deeper into um, light pollution and dark sky initiatives. And it's just, there's a really beautiful interactive 3D map on this that shows light pollution all over the globe. It's, it's really interesting. But it just walks people through some of these tangible things that they can do to reduce their light pollution footprint. Um, and I try and be kind of fun and light with it. I don't want to come off as, you know, the jerk that I secretly am. So I try and have some humor in here and I hope people kind of find it funny. Um, so the next thing that folks can do is, is go wild. So what does this mean? Well, it means, you know, we can reduce our pesticides, we can reduce our herbicides, we can let a corner of our garden grow up a little bit, and maybe we can plant some native species that these native fireflies are, you know, really used to having around, and so is all their food sources and things like that. So talking a little bit about what does that mean? So planting native, um, I do talk a little bit about the central basin. We have some really interesting and beautiful plant species here. So all of these species that you see in this photo are, are native species um, and they make a gorgeous garden. You know, I know we all probably watch like Monty Don and these other gardening shows and these beautiful English gardens, but we can achieve a lot of those effects with our own native species as well. Um, there's some really interesting initiatives out there online related to this. Um, so uh, Doug Ptolemy, he's a researcher that really uh, champions for native plant gardening and he has some great resources. So I encourage you to check out his initiatives. Eliminate the herbicides and the pesticides. Um, any chemical that is meant to kill another species just cannot possibly be good. There's just I don't, <laughs> I've never understood it, um, but it's definitely not good for the species in our backyard and the biodiversity in our backyard. And I know a lot of people do it for like mosquito and tick control. But the thing is, is that if we have a healthy ecosystem, those things all keep each other in check because everything, there's a food chain. You know, we forget our lessons about food chains, but there's always something out there that will eat you. And so if we kind of foster all of those things that eat each other, they will take care of each other. So, you know, eliminate those herbicides, eliminate those pesticides. Not only is it bad for the biodiversity in our backyards, but who wants to be walking around barefoot in their backyard that they just sprayed with mosquito chemicals and things like that? Um, you know, that's just a recipe for, for cancer and unhealthy, you know, issues propping up. So there's a lot of information out there about that. And I link out to some of that and then let it go. You know, if you can't plant native or you don't, you know, have a capacity to kind of do those other things, there's other things you can do just like letting, you know, behind your fence grow up a little bit, just enough so your neighbors don't call codes on you. Um, because the fireflies really like to crawl up on the, the grass, you know, fronds, they're not fronds, but they like to crawl up. And then from there, they kind of launch out and if you're out in your backyard in the early evening and you're watching them, um, it's really cool because they come up from the ground, they're beetles. And so you'll see them kind of start to light up your lawn. And then as the evening goes on, you see that they rise and then you'll see them in the trees. And it's really beautiful. So if you allow some of those spaces to kind of grow up, then they've got little things to crawl up on and kind of places to hide. And, um, you know, if you live in a bunch of grass and someone comes and mows it, You've, you've destroyed the home, so nobody likes that. So, you know, let little paces grow up a little bit. So the last one is really, you know, going wet. And what does that mean? Um, fireflies are actually, I think, a really interesting species because for as charismatic as they are, they're really understudied. We actually don't know a whole lot about them, but we do have some preliminary observations. And one of them is that anywhere we find fireflies, we find water nearby. So either stream sides, um, next to ponds, things like that, or in really humid environments, which we're in Tennessee, we have humid environments, we have streams, and therefore we have fireflies. Um, some folks in California don't get that same pleasure of having fireflies or out in the desert, things like that. So if you're providing them with a fresh water source, um, then you're really providing a little additional habitat. And it doesn't have to be a uh, pond or something like that. This is my <laughs> little homemade. I went to Southeastern Savage. I don't know if you all go there and they have these stone bowls that I've always wanted an excuse to purchase, but I am not remodeling a bathroom anytime soon. So I finally got my husband to let me purchase one and make a bird bath out of it. Um, so some Home Depot pebbles and a Southeastern Salvage sink later, I have my burbling bird bath. Um, 
and there's some you can find online. You don't have to get crafty like this at all. And I'm sure you could probably do way better if you did. Um, so there's that. And then there's, of course, the people that go all out. They make their ponds and things like that. But there's also compost. You know, that creates humidity as well. And it creates a little home for critters to, to kind of live in. And, you know, one thing that boggles my mind is that there's books on compost which is amazing to me because it's literally rotting food and I don't need a book to tell me that I need to clean out my fridge. Um, and so it's a really easy thing to start. You know, you have some old food, uh, then throw it in your compost and it's as easy as starting a little pile. And you just start to foster these critters and start to foster some homes, um, you know, in your own backyard. So again, there's humor threaded throughout all of this, I really encourage you all to explore. And then, you know, there's additional info. It's mostly just a little biography, but I'm going to start accumulating some uh, different news sources, other articles that link out to any of these issues. So yes, all of this helps fireflies, but if we take these steps in our backyard, then we're actually helping a lot of other species as well. And in any given year in my own backyard, um, the biodiversity I get is, is pretty fascinating. And every year I'm checking off my list of birds. I sometimes get new birds and species I haven't seen before. Butterflies that I'm getting in the backyard, of course, the fireflies. And it's just fascinating, you know, to walk out in my own backyard, and especially in times of COVID when I'm stuck to my house, to be able to have a landscape outside that I can go and explore and, and see things is just fascinating. And I think everyone can benefit from. So um, that's it about my fireflies. I will share some of these links and um, yeah, if there's any questions, I'll stop blabbing on right now. <laughs> hey, uh, could you entertain some questions? Of course, yes, yes. All right. So specific plants for fireflies. That's uh, David Withers' question to me directly. I actually don't know that. And, and that's where, you know, when I go, I was, when I first got into my interest in fireflies, I was reading some scientific papers on it. And we know very little about fireflies is kind of the bottom line. We know a few things and most of the, the papers tend to focus more on their flash patterns, which makes sense. You know, that's the first thing we're drawn to and less about what are their actual habitat requirements. So a lot of the stuff we know um, just kind of through uh, observation, not necessarily measured observation, if that makes sense. I'm gonna ask about a bush pile. Yeah, how about a brush pile? Brush yeah, pile so, brush pile. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely brush piles. Um, so, you know, if, if you were to come visit my yard, we've actually got a few different piles um, I don't know what my neighbors think about that. We try and keep it nice looking, but we have our compost pile, which is kind of for the garden. We have a little food waste pile that we just, uh, just to not throw it in the trash that we don't really ever use for anything. And then we have a brush pile behind our fence. And over time that breaks down as well. And there's all sorts of critters. So when we go back to thinking about Tennessee and how we have all these different habitats, which is why we have so many species, we can think of our yards that way too. So if you've got a compost and a brush pile, you're serving uh, different purposes for probably different species, which is great. <laughs> snakes can be a good thing, you know, because they eat the rats and the mice and things like that. So if you've got black snakes in your backyard and things like that, you're, you're sitting pretty. I'm a little jealous. What do the larvae eat? Okay, so the fireflies that we see flashing, they are adults actually, which is why they're trying to find the one. You know, it's it's freaky time for them. It's uh, you know, R-rated, not not PG. So the PG version of fireflies, their larvae, they are actually living in the soil. And so they're eating um, little worms, they're eating little tiny other critters that live in the soil and they uh, predate or they eat those. Um, Firefly behavior is actually really interesting. So I think the ladies on the call will appreciate the story. Uh, the Most of the fireflies that we see flashing in our yards are males and they're trying to attract their female mates. The females are sitting in the tops of trees typically or in the tops of brush and things like that. And they very lightly flash in return if they're interested. And when you get into the Smokies and some of these places where we have like 
you know, a lot of species of fireflies. There are some fireflies, females in particular, that flash to attract other male fireflies. And then when they attract them, they will eat them. And I just think that is hilarious and it cracks me up. But uh, <laughs> the female fireflies, they let the males do all the work and if they're interested, they'll flash in return, but they're kind of lazy about it. So if you look real close in your trees, sometimes you can see the females. You talked <laughs> about the uh, echinacea, the native echinacea. Can you buy that for your yard or does it only, you know, they only found out in the wild? That's a great question. So it, it used to be a federally listed species. It was our first federally listed species, I think in Tennessee and, and potentially the first federally listed plant species ever. And part of the recovery story for that species is that botanists went out into their native habitat where they found it and they took the seeds and they spread them elsewhere. Some of those seeds have made it into the horticultural industry, which is a good thing, I think. Um, sometimes it can be a bad thing, but the seeds made it into the horticultural industry and you can purchase them now. So on my uh, Go Wild, I mention um, one native plant garden that I, I am aware of and they're called Grow Wild and they're out in Fairview and they sell native plant species and the Echinacea tennesseensis is one of them. Um, but to be fair, I've got a couple different species of echinacea in, in my garden, so um, don't feel like too bad about it. I'm not one of those people that's like only plant native species. I know some other people are, but there's ways you can you can do all sorts of stuff, but they are available. I see hey, one Sunny, last we question. Have, in, we yeah. have a couple more questions, yeah. uh, Valerie, that were in the chat room. Yeah. Okay. Um, one is, uh, my neighbors are always talking in our Facebook group about leaving outdoor lights on for safety, preventing crime. Any yeah. ideas on how to nicely combat this? <laughs> well, that's the whole reason I built this web page in the first place. So I would, I would actually encourage you to share this with them. But, um, you know, I think one thing that folks may not be aware of is that they can take those same security lights and they can switch them out with the motion detecting lights. And one of the carrots that you can kind of dangle in front of them is that that's actually going to save them money in the long run too, because then their electricity is not on constantly all night. Um, and that, you know, I gave this presentation to our Rosebank Neighborhood Association and we had one of our local, I forget her name and I, I'm terrible at names, but one of our police chiefs was on the call and she was like, make sure you just tell them to swap them out with motion detecting lights, not get rid of them all together. And I, I laughed because that is the suggestion I, I had made. But um, yeah, I mean, I think just being honest about it and saying like, hey, I saw this thing. Maybe we can consider swapping your lights out with motion detecting lights. And it's it's tricky to approach your neighbors and try and not come off like a jerk. I get it. But that's why you can share this and that start that conversation. <laughs> And, and we had a couple of weeks ago um, a conversation about that um, and flooding your yard with lighting doesn't necessarily make you any safer. Um, <laughs> so you may want to check back to that video um, to uh, get some good arguments on why um, having all those bright lights may not be the best thing for your in a lot of yeah. ways. Yeah. yeah, I kind of crack up when, you know, I still see on next door all the time people are getting broken into and, you know, it doesn't matter how many lights you have in your yard. <laughs> <laughs> Could you put the uh, website information in the yes, chat absolutely. for us? Yes. So here is the website. Oh, and I, the one thing I forgot to uh, show you all, and you'll see it down at the bottom of the first page, but actually, am I still sharing my screen? You are. Oh, fantastic. Okay, good. I don't have to do this again. So I have a pledge map that folks can sign. And the idea is that we can visually start to build these corridors throughout Nashville of folks that are pledging to do any number of these things. So you don't have to choose all of them. Like I know some people just really do not want a water feature in their yard or, you know, the idea of planting native is too overwhelming for them and they hate gardening, whatever. So you can choose any one of these or all of them. And it does ask for your dress because that puts it on the map. Um, and then you can you can add your little firefly to our map. So I encourage everyone to at least pledge one thing that you can do and take some initiative on in your own backyard. So yeah, one last question about what is their lifespan, fireflies? Ooh, 
that is a good idea, a good question rather. And I actually do not know. Um, I think they're fairly short. Certainly by the time that they are adults, they're pretty short lived. You know, they don't flash for very long. Um, but I think they spend, I want to say at least, you know, two years of a life cycle, probably most of that time is lived as a um, larvae in, in the soil, which is why, you know, don't mess with your soil. Don't pour a bunch of pesticides and stuff on it. <laughs> mm, yeah. Well, Sunny, thank you so much. It's been a really informative presentation. I learned a lot tonight. Um, I'm really glad. Thank you for having me. You really help. Uh, thank you for helping us better understand uh, about the, the life of fireflies and how we can keep them glowing. <laughs> yeah. And audience, thank you so much for your questions and being here tonight. Please join us next week when we'll have Jeff Hammond. Uh, the assistant director with Metro Public Works, and he's going to be discussing with, discussing with us the state of sidewalks in Metro. That's going to be a hot topic, guys. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again. You all take care, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.